they are the creator of Yville. Some of you may have heard Yville, and it's an amazing uh, game, uh, online gaming program and educational tool for students. So uh, Jim is going to help us with the demonstration of the new Westinghouse interactive digital whiteboard. So Jim, I will turn it over to you. Oh, okay, good. Great, so what I'm actually doing, first of all, how many of you have heard of Wyville? No 12-year-olds here, really? That's such a shame. Every year at CES, I wish there were more. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so I'm actually going to give you a 10-minute keynote speech, uh, which I do a lot these days, and then we're going to show you the whiteboard in action. The whiteboard is actually owned, manufactured, and sold by Westinghouse, okay? What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you context first. Oh, and by the way, we would like you, some of you, to use the whiteboard. Okay? The guys in the front row can't see me. That's okay. So let me make a couple of overarching points. First, transforming EDU. Education has already been transformed. Eight-year-olds are doing that. I think the question here is, will EDU catch up and become relevant to that? I've been actively involved since the early 80s, actually, in figuring out how to use this kind of technology to educate children. And here's actual evidence. You can't hear it. Anyway, this was a, uh, that's actually a corn farm. The first virtual world learning game we launched was a corn farm in 1987. Uh, and that's actually my son as a seven-year-old playing it. So the point is that we've been in the business of figuring out how to use this technology for a long time. And Wyville, who most of you in this room don't know about, actually was the first virtual world on the internet, browser-based. It's the first learning and game-based world. It currently has 7.5 million users. Average age 13, 74% girls. We heard in previous panels about collaborative learning. We've been doing that for a long time. And it works. That's why we have 7.5 million children with no advertising. One other point for the business people in the room, the technology is patented. And one other, couple of other quick points, didactic points. I'm a professor. Sorry, if you don't know about learning and classrooms, okay, that is not a badge you wear proudly. And it probably means you're not going to be successful. Okay? Also, please be aware of neuromarketing. I'm actually a computational neurobiologist. So in my other life, I'm a neurobiologist. Please, whenever someone says, the neuroscience says that my game works. Leave. If you are interested in knowing more about Wyville from an academic point of view, this is a book published by MIT Press this summer. We had nothing to do with it. This is an entire book on Wyville and how Wyville works educationally. And so now, some of you already know you don't want to listen to me. And you don't have to. In fact, I'd prefer you didn't. OK? What I want you to do, and it's hard to do in balancing your lunch, but what you can do is go to ces.wyville.net, OK, and start playing. All right? And then we'll catch up with you in a few minutes. <laughs> and just to let you know, you're going to be playing with factoring numbers which is really cool despite what Nickelodeon thinks. So what are we transforming? People have talked about history, and they've gone back like to the early 20s. The truth is the structure we are transforming started around year 1000, when human populations in the Western world started to head towards an exponential climb 
which produced a huge scalability problem in education. There were two inventions, core to solve that problem. One was the printing press, and the other was the university. The technology we use today, the structure of education today, derives from decisions that were made during that period of time about how you use that technology in that format. Just as an example, 1350 to 1450 was known as the manuscript era, in which people invented what books looked like. Books are inventions. Textbooks are an invention. Prior to that, there were no tables of contents, no list of chapters, no running headlines, no page numbers, no subject index. All that was an invented, given we had the technology, how do you now design it to do something? And multiple choice tests came along shortly thereafter. This is where we are now. We are in the 14th and 15th century with a new technology, and we have to figure out what the equivalent of chapters are. Okay? Simply taking the old structured technology built on the wrong educational technology and putting it on the internet is a complete waste of time. Taking a textbook and putting it on the internet is a waste of time. Okay? Core question that you should be thinking, how many of you actually want to make money in the educational tech business? Honestly. Why are the rest of you here? <laughs> lunch, it's free lunch. Got it. <clears throat> so, what are the, the question you should be asking if you want to operate in this domain? The core question is, okay? What are the consequences of 600-year-old technology for the structure of today's education, and how does new technology change that? And I'm going to give you a couple of examples, and then we're going to use the whiteboard. So as I said, online curriculum, taking textbooks with chapters and animating them and making them colorful and putting them online, and I don't care if you can tell a friend, add it to your favorites or link to the page, is misusing the technology today. It's not taking advantage of it. For example, just one example. Math education is essentially cumulative folklore. You learn this, and then you learn that, and then you learn this, and then you learn that in some sequence that's in the textbooks. That's probably 70% folklore that's accumulated over 600 years. There's not much evidence, cognitive or otherwise, that that's how you learn. So games, games are cool. Kids love games. We should be able to teach them with games. 99% of the games that are out there, educational games that are out there, are either curriculum-based or the learning, math as an example, is an obstacle in the game. The kid wants to save the princess. Oh, sorry, you have to solve a math problem on the way. <laughs> it's the message, right? Kids are motivated to play games, so maybe we can motivate them to learn by tricking them into learning. Okay? Some games are now, like Aces Up Solitaire, people can show you, well, you can teach this in second, third, and fourth grade, but they're not integrated to the learning. Okay, first thing. Secondly, all these different games are different. All right, you can now go to numerous sites on the internet where they'll give you a smorgasbord, a catalog of games you can pick for your classroom. But none of them are connected to the learning in any significant way. <clears throat> okay, one other significant consequence of the bad old technology. We group kids in classroom by age. It makes no sense. Ask a teacher, it makes no sense. By the way, we don't really, and they're really stressed middle schools in the United States, 20% of the kids are actually have failed. So we actually have kids in seventh grade classrooms that range in age from eight to 14. So even that's broken. So what do we do? This is what I'm talking about here, and we're gonna show you in a second on the whiteboard, is a project funded by the National Science Foundation that we've been working with an organization called EDC. Does anyone know EDC in this room? EDC is probably the premier curriculum development company in the world, organization in the world. It's been doing it since 52. It's a huge operation internationally. 
you should look further, look at them. They actually know about curriculum and curricular structure and learning. So I want to demonstrate quickly, and then that's connected to this, our approach. When we started this project, I asked their learning experts and our technology experts, what is a core mathematical concept currently fundamentally misunderstood by sixth graders that they need to understand to do math? Anyone know? What? Equals. Equals. There's somebody here that knows something about learning. <laughs> and why, sir, did you know that? No, that's exact, because I told you ahead of time? No. It's equals. They don't understand equals. They think of the equal sign as computer scientists do. It's an assignment. They don't understand that it actually is a concept, a, a function that relates this thing on this side to that thing on that side. So we decide to take on equals. And by the way, if you don't understand what equals is, how can you do math? Second question, and this is, again, on the internet, no one that comes to Wyville can only do this because they're eight. Okay? They do what they want to do. And some of the eight-year-olds do stuff that 20-year-olds do. So we design educational motifs, and we have a whole catalog of them at this point, which capture a certain type of learning we want to do. And in this particular case, the challenge was, let's go something that goes from three-year-olds to college that's the same motif. Anyone want to guess? You want to guess at what the motif is for equality? I'll give you a clue. It's the first physics you saw as a child. Mobiles. OK? Although the mobile you saw was designed for your parents, not for you. But anyway, because it's looking at the parents, the cute, anyway, it doesn't matter. So mobiles. It turns out with mobiles, you can do something that's pre-K all the way to systems of equations. Same motif. You don't have to relearn a new game in third grade to play with third grade stuff or at this level of math. Okay. So now we're going to do, how many of you actually decided not to eat and instead go on and play with mobiles on Wyville? That's too bad. You should. Because it's collaborative. Kids make mobiles to challenge other kids. They cooperate in building them. They cooperate in solving them. What I'm going to do now, by the way, you can do this anytime. Wyville's free. If you go to ces.wyville.net, it'll pop you right into a place where you can play with mobiles. But what I'm going to do now, and by the way, if you want to hear more about this, we have a booth in the Eureka Innovation Space in the Venetian Marco Polo Room. You can come talk to us about this if you want. But now, the whiteboard. So Jen Sun, who's president of the company, is going to pretend to be a teacher. Actually, she doesn't have to pretend, but she's going to pretend here. And to do that, she needs my microphone. Okay, so I'm going to pretend that you're my class. Okay, and class, we've been doing factoring. And so let's try to see what we've learned about factoring can help us solve some puzzles. This is the mobile puzzle motif, which you're all familiar with because you've been doing it since you've been kindergarten. But very quickly again, imagine I'm holding a coat hanger in my hand, and the mobile has shapes hanging on either sides. And your goal is to try to find the shape weight so that your mobile is balanced. So what does that mean? So I have a whiteboard function here, but I think we didn't start it up. So the, 
No, it's, uh, it's okay. yes, it's that. Excellent, thank you. Yes, excellent student here. So in this mobile, the total weight is 24. And so in order to balance it, what does each arm need to weigh? 12. So this arm needs to weigh 12, and this arm needs to weigh 12. So what you will notice is that we have squares on one side and circles on the other side. And so you can recognize this. This is a factoring problem. How many, what are the ways you can factor 12? The important point is that all of the, all of the, the number in each of the squares and the number in the circles has to be the same number. Yes, every square weighs the same and every circle weighs the same. So what might a square weigh? Three. three. Let's try three. Whoops, I need to get out of this mode and drag a three. Ah, uh, I think my hand's not dry enough in order there. OK, and so now the balance is off because we also need to select a value for the circles. What would the circle be? Four, let's see. Four. Here we go. We got a balanced mobile. Great. Good job. So can I have two students come up here and try out a mobile challenge for us? Two brave students. Good. Excellent. Thank you. Another one? Please. Come on. By the way, the Westinghouse smart board is a six-touch sensor board so that two students can use it at the same time. So this is your side, Sorry, and you can um, drag the values onto the shape to solve the mobile. By the way, is a timer? <laughs> Oops. No, nope, waving hands. Okay, it doesn't on. detect waving hands. No. We need to be able to, there. Ding. Uh, OK. <laughs> Just tap a little, tap a little, tap part. Or you can do that. You can enter a weight. <laughs> By the way, two, two things uh, to say. In the real here. world, kids will have been doing this for the entire week through Wyville or through try, um, the virtual world eight? online. And they will be actually showing up yeah. to show what they know in class. Or some of them may actually be in, the, in a virtual world online, and you will actually be teachers interacting with potentially hundreds of kids solving these problems. One other point, in this case, we made the puzzles, but actually in Wyville, the kids make the puzzles themselves to challenge other kids in the community, which is a major motivator for them. So I think that we've well burnt through our allocated time, and there are four other three other people here desperate to demonstrate. It's clear this audience needs some work on factoring numbers. <laughs> so. Good. Yay. A hand for our two brave students. Very nice. All right. So now, class, you've taken a look at factoring, and you've done some puzzles. And so for homework tonight, we'd like you to go on Yville and do some mobile puzzles together with other kids in Wyville, where you can solve puzzles together, and you can even create your own puzzles, and then share them with your friends. Great. Or you can do 150 other things not related to math. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you yep. very much. Thank you to Westinghouse. Okay, we're going to keep the uh, smart board on the side here for a while, if we can. Uh, no, not in front, but maybe we can pull it on the side where it was earlier. Yeah, we'll have to move the plug. But that way everybody can uh, stop by and uh, play with the whiteboard. I know everybody wants to. I do. I want to just feel like Tom Cruise, you know, in the movies. <laughs> So next up is our other new fun gadget, which is called Swivel. So Brian, take it from here. 
So there's a slight deck work from here. <laughs> okay. There we go. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Brian Lamb, and I'm the founder of Swivel. So what is Swivel? Swivel, we call it a robotic platform for learning. It's made up of two things. A robot that helps you capture lessons, lectures, and presentations, as well as learning experiences. And then a cloud solution to go along with that to privately and securely host your videos and deliver it to people you want to share it with and not with people that you don't. That's it at a basic level. So stepping back from that, let's talk about why is there a need for a swivel in the world. So from our observation, the use of online video is exploding in education. Uh, there's a list of use cases here that I've brought up here, more being invented every day. And the reason why is it's the best way to span distances, to capture skills and, and share them with other people for feedback, and to deliver learning content over distances, as well as out of time synchronization with class. So video is a very, very powerful and necessary learning tool. It's also being used for MOOCs. And of course, you've probably sat through some conversations today around the relevance of MOOCs towards education, what they're doing well and what they're doing not so well. Uh, what we thought from watching MOOCs success is it proves one thing. Online video is a very important tool for education. The amount of people that they sign up for the classes is phenomenal. This is the way people want to digest and view learning content. The flip side of that is it's also proving that breaking the student-teacher relationship is a bad thing for education. Teachers are very necessary to enforce learning and guide students down a personalized path, and something that MOOCs are really just not set up to do. In addition to that, uh, it's also proving another thing, which is that capturing video content is actually kind of difficult. So you need a camera person, you need an editor, you need the professor or the teacher capturing the content. You need disparate technology like cameras, microphones, computers to edit the, the content, and storage systems that are not linked to that or not really set up well for video. And you need to be able to learn how to use all of those things. And then simply, you just need lots of time. So not only do you have to spend the time capturing the content, but you have to spend hours learning how to use the equipment as well as producing the content. So the bottom line is it's just not scalable. And I think you see the evidence of that in MOOC platforms where there are really only hundreds of people creating content for all of those viewers. It's not thousands. It's not tens of thousands. There's just not that many people that can produce good learning content on a regular basis. So that brings us back to Swivel. So in a detailed level, what is Swivel? Swivel is a robot that helps you capture yourself on video. Uh, the robot actually follows you as you present, as you move around a room. It'll actually track you and keep you centered on the, on the view of the camera. I've actually got one set up here precariously on top of the uh, speaking uh, lectern here. And you can see as I move around, it's actually following me as I move back and forth. I can actually go meet with students, move in front of a bank of whiteboards. All of that gets captured on video. It also has a, uh, what we call a marker, but it's actually a, a remote microphone, a remote control, and a tracker in one. So you can capture video that sounds great. You can really hear what people are saying, making the content really information rich. Second thing Swivel is, is it's an app. Uh, the app not only captures video, but it does uh, some really neat stuff in terms of capturing uh, slide decks for playback as well as presentation to an audience. So it's about bringing learning content into the video for playback. And finally, the cloud platform is made for delivering content to integrate media like slide decks. It's also made to be secure and private, so you're not putting content on YouTube and having people get led to cat videos and the wrong things that you don't want them to view. You also get analytics of who watched it. So if I uh, share it with a class and I want to know, did all of my 30 students see it, I get all of the metrics back. So those are some of the details of Swivel. Uh, this is actually not our first product. So we're launching a new version today. We have the cloud service we're launching, but we've actually had a first version of the product. I was actually rousing success in education. So a lot of the information I'm sharing with you is out of our success in education. We sold into uh, schools all around the country, thousands of schools, uh, hundreds of universities, anything from Ivy League schools down to community colleges. We sold product to South Africa, to Singapore, to South Korea. We actually have more people creating content with Swivel than all of the content creators on all of the MOOC platforms combined. So we're actually creating more content than all of the MOOC platforms. Uh, it's proving the fact that a tool that helps people capture video and simplifies the experience can help them create content. So what I'm going to do is walk you through a quick demo of what it's like to, to operate Swivel and to create course content. 
just to give you a sense of how easy it can possibly be for a teacher. So first off, you grab your iPad as you're walking into class. And by the way, Civil fits in a carrying case about this size, so it's easy for you to walk into class and uh, carry everything you need with you. You don't need any special equipment beyond that. Uh, you open up the app and you say, hey, I, okay, am I going to capture video if I'm just working on whiteboards or do I want to capture slides? So I, I pick the next, you know, whatever I want to do there. In this case, it says, okay, here's a list of slides to pick from that have been synced from our service. So I downloaded you know, the Rockies or something about an art class I was going to uh, deliver a lecture on that day. And then simply set it up on the swivel. So I put it on a table or I could put it on a tripod. Uh, but essentially just drop it in place and you're pretty much ready to present from that point forward. And you can see there's a slide deck that's being shown. There's a clock about how long you've been recording video. Uh, and then that also shows you a preview of the video that gets captured. Uh, the remote control allows you to just turn it on and you can capture parts of class you want to capture and other parts you don't. Of course, most students don't, wa don't want to watch video that drones on and on for hours. They want to see concentrated content. So you say, I'm going to capture this 10, 15, or 20 minute span and just that and not the rest of the class. Uh, and then simply start teaching. So you can move around the class. You can interact with students. You can work across whiteboards, capture all of that while you're moving around. The swivel is a front of class solution, so it's close enough for you to see whiteboards, capture that as a part of the video, and make sure it's a really media rich um, video that you've captured and delivered. When you're done, uh, there's a library of content for you to review that, upload it, and then quickly publish it to a group that you've pre-populated. So if you have a class of students that you're sharing it with, or if you've got a, a mentorship team that's giving you professional development, uh, you just simply set up that list, hit publish, and it automatically goes out to them. And then uh, it uploads, uh, as you can see, going through a process of uploading and publishing. And this is the player within our, within our hosting environment. So you can see there's video on the left. If there's media that you want to display, it's automatically time synchronized. So it's displayed on the left of the screen there. Uh, as you work through the video, you can navigate by slide. So if the learning content is there, you can pick and choose where you want to view that video. Um, and also drop comments and give feedback to the instructor. So if students are viewing that, they can give feedback on what was good, what wasn't good, and how it worked for them. So at a top level, that's it. That's what Swivel is. What is Swivel? It's an efficiency tool. It means an instructor can walk into a class, they can self-capture their own video and create learning content while they teach, not necessarily just after they teach, uh, and be able to share that with people. It reduces the number of people you need to do it, the amount of time you need to do it, uh, and just makes the whole process easier. And by the way, I didn't even mention the fact, the, the original idea behind the robot in the first place was most people feel self-conscious on stage and on camera. Right? We all feel a little bit nervous if someone points a camera at us. We all feel a lot more comfortable with a robot pointed at us, it turns out. And the robot is a tool that just makes people relax about using video. So Swivel is a tool for efficiency with video. And if it's efficient and it's easy, you're going to capture more video. So not only are you going to capture class, but office hours can be captured, informal learning interactions, and things like meetings and corporate training even can be rolled into that. So it's a solution that really makes video a flexible and easy solution for educators and beyond. So that's it. That's Swivel, the robotic platform. Thank you. Wow. We, we have just a couple minutes. Does anyone have a question for Brian about Swivel? Yes, sir. If you can stand up. I, I don't think I can run over there fast enough, but go ahead. Well, so um, first of all, there's a lot of iPads in schools already. Uh, so what we're trying to do is build more value into the assets that schools have already bought. Um, and they've also got pretty nice cameras in them already. Uh, so what we've also learned through our, our sales of our first swivel is there's a good enough standard. A front-facing camera that's 720p definitely meets the good enough standard. If you get far, far higher in resolution, it's just a tougher piece, uh, piece of information to manage and, and share with other people. So really, we think that the cameras within iPads, iPhones, Android devices are very sufficient for people to capture good quality content. Great. One more question. Yes. Oh, yeah. Where do you good get question. it? So Swivel, the, the base unit retails for $299. It's a very affordable solution for schools. 
there are uh, free hosting services included in the purchase of the Swivel. And then for advanced users that use it a lot, there are tiers of fees associated with the use of that. But it's all aimed at being very affordable so that this is not a centralized solution that people are setting up in one classroom. It's something that can be used in more than one classroom across a department at a time. Also, if you guys wanted to see live demos, of course, we've got a booth at the Venetian. 71221 is our booth number. We'd be happy to show you a demo of the services, a demo of all of the stuff I'm showing you here, again, kind of precariously up on stage. But we'd be happy to walk you through that. Uh, we think we have a really cool solution. And Brian, where can they buy it? Uh, you can buy it from civil.com, Amazon, b and Photo, and actually there's a variety of education resellers that we're working with that are probably in your neck of the woods, and, and we'd be happy to connect the dots. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank love you. I love that swivel. <laughs> OK, next up is our, our next presenter is Sheep, which is a new online tool called Osmosis. So I will turn this over to you as Great. well. So thank Great. you. Thank you, Carrie. Um, can I get the slides pulled up? Maybe it's just, oh, there it is. There it is. Okay, great. Oh, that's not my background color, but I, I think I'll make do. Hopefully, there won't be uh, something lost in translation. But first of all, thank you again for the invitation. It's an honor to be here at Transforming EDU. I was just mentioning to Carrie earlier that not only is the quality of the speakers really impressive that all the people I've met, but the quality of the audiences as well, uh, the people I've been talking to. So uh, it's exciting to be here. Uh, my other hat that I wear is I'm a medical student at Johns Hopkins. But I've taken time off uh, and scared my parents in the process to co-found an education technology company aimed at medical students first called Osmosis. And we launched officially in August uh, with a mobile, uh, mobile app. That, and now we have about 6,500 medical students, 5% uh, of the entire US medical student market um, on our platform. And we're delivering questions to them via an innovative mobile solution. Uh, and I'm going to take the next few minutes to talk to you about some of the things we're thinking about, about how to innovate uh, through mobile as well as wrap up with a few uh, devices that, you know, since we're here at CES, a few devices that I'm really excited about that Osmosis is looking at to potentially integrate and get a whole new data stream about users. So how many of you have heard of the term learning by osmosis? Do you know what that is? Raise your hand. Right? How many of you have actually tried learning by osmosis? <laughs> so I've tried multiple times, and uh, we just wrapped up a final, uh, finals in December. And so I used Twitter to find students all around the world who were trying to learn by osmosis. And this is what came up. Uh, not only is it middle school students, it's pilots. I don't know if there's a, oh, whoops. Uh, pilots on top left. We have a medical student sleeping over there. We have a um, high school student trying to learn the ACT. I wonder if having the book upside down is, uh, is appropriate. And I know somebody from the ACT was here earlier. Um, and then we also have cats, and those are the cutest uh, of them. Uh, so people, uh, students dream uh, literally about learning by osmosis. They really want a passive solution where they can learn and retain information on the go without actually having to open up a textbook um, or a laptop and, and, and devote time to learning. And so the mission of my company is to make learning easier, to make it more efficient, kind of what Swivel does for capturing video. And we're focused on medical education for a couple of reasons. First, it's our area of domain expertise. My co-founder and I are both uh, medical students. Um, more importantly, because we think that if we can solve the problem for medical students, we can solve it for other areas of expertise. This is for a couple of reasons. One is because um, medical, uh, you know, in most fields, forgetting means fr frustration. But in medical uh, education, the stakes are really high. You, know, you can forget how to factor, and that's, that, you know, that's terrible, but a lot, of, a lot of kids probably don't care. But if a medical student forgets a side effect of a drug, that could affect a patient. Um, another reason, and probably more importantly, is that it's such a huge body of information. And it's dynamic. It's constantly changing. So students have to keep learning um, on the go. A question for, for one of you just shouted out. What's the average age of a medical uh, resident when they graduate? Just guess. It's about 30, yeah. It's about 30. And so I found this uh, hardening but also disheartening at the same time uh, graph showing the global life expectancy from 10,000 BC to early 2000s. And as you can see, for about 99% of hum hum humanity, the global life expectancy was less than how long it takes to become a doctor. So <laughs> this is the definition of lifelong learning. Another reason um, I, you know, I find medicine very interesting uh, as an as a initial case that we're working on is um, I see a lot of similarities between clinicians and uh, teachers. Uh, the best clinicians and best teachers I've had are very good at behavior change. They both have to take patients or students and motivate them 
to or change their behavior somehow. Uh, one just wants people to exercise more or eat more healthy. The other one wants people to, or students to learn more. Um, and so we're looking at technologies that will enable this behavior change and make both clinicians and students, uh, teachers, more effective at what they do. And I use um, tech for behavior change. I use the FOG behavior model as a framework for thinking about how to change uh, behavior of our students. So FOG basically boils it down to, and he says, behavior is motivation, ability, and trigger all at the same time. And he has this graph that shows on the y-axis motivation and on the x-axis ability. And if you think about you know, your New, Year, New Year's resolution, it'll probably fall somewhere in this graph. Right? There's varying levels of motivation. Obviously, around New Year, it's pretty high. And then the ability to do something like lose weight or study for the SAT can sometimes be very hard for certain students if they don't have the resources or the time. What Fogg says, and I think it's very insightful, is technology shouldn't focus necessarily on motivation. Because even for medical students that I know um, who are type A or type AA in some instances, uh, it's very hard to keep them at a high level of motivation for a long period of time. He says use technology instead to improve somebody's ability to change their behavior as well as and get them past this yellow line, which is an activation threshold, where then you can trigger them to make that actual behavior change. And this is, kind of, this is how we think about osmosis and mobile learning. We have um, a mobile app that we released in August, as I mentioned. It's a free iOS app. So if you have time, just download it and check it out. And what we've done is incorporated elements of behavior change, as well as um, uh, other things that will help them retain information for longer. And one example of that is a push notification interface. So we send. At this point, we've probably sent 3,000 push notifications today alone to medical students all across the world. Um, and we send about 6,000 a day. Uh, push notifications like this, clinical cases that then take them right into the app where they can answer, a que answer the question and uh, read the explanations as well as watch, watch videos, mnemonics, um, images, et cetera. And our secret sauce is what we do with all this data, how we decide what content to push to which student at what time. Uh, because students are, you know, as I mentioned, medical students need lifelong learning, so we have to actually deliver this information, not in front of a computer or through a textbook, but with their smartphone. Um, and so if I were to boil it down, we're, we're delivering millions of questions to your future doctors to keep them up to date on their medical knowledge. And if I were to summarize what osmosis, uh, what our vision is, um, i have use this slide. Basically, there's a gap between what somebody learns in the curriculum, in the educational years, and what they have to know for their professional careers or real life. In one direction, what we're doing is we're improving students' retention, and that's through the mobile app and all the, um, the big data type stuff we're doing there. And the other direction, it's we improve the relevance. While somebody's in school, uh, we, bring in we bring in real life examples and whatnot that'll get them to retain information more, but also to be more engaged. And I view osmosis as a catalyst. And so obviously the mobile app is the top. The bottom is our web app. And I won't talk about that right now. Instead, I'll switch gears to educational gadgets because we're here at CES. Um, so osmosis is also looking at some gadgets to incorporate other dimensions of uh, student behavior into what we're doing. Um, I write for a medical technology blog called MedGadget. And I've always considered uh, maybe launching a sister site uh, called EdGadget. Uh, but I'm too busy. But if any of you are interested in that, uh, feel free to talk to me right after. And I see a lot of cool gadgets being produced, not necessarily for educational purposes, but that have ramifications and applications to education. Uh, one of the earliest experiments I did with a medical device um, for education was using an electroencephalogram um, headset. This was called a Zio, and you basically wear it while you sleep. And it measures your brainwave activity as you're sleeping, and then gives you an output like this, where it's basically the, let me see if this works. Uh, you can see uh, this is my sleep cycle from about 12 a.m. to 7 a.m. And red is where you're awake. Uh, light green is where you're in REM, which is typically associated with dreaming as well as synthesis of information. Um, gray is light sleep, and uh, dark green is deep sleep. And this is a normal output for what I was used to when I was sleeping. I decided to do an experiment uh, my first year of med school uh, where I was testing audio osmosis. And I was basically, I was wearing one of these headbands as I was listening to six, seven hours of med school lectures while I was sleeping. It was wishful thinking that maybe I could learn subconsciously. Uh, <laughs> and, but don't worry, no, no uh, roommates or girlfriends were, were hurt uh, in the course of the study. <laughs> Unfortunately, it did not work what I, how, how I thought it would. Instead, as you can see, I was just waking up multiple time points throughout the night instead of, instead of actually, I was hoping for more REM as I was synthesizing information from subconscious temporal uh, involvement. But um, 
you get the point is you know, maybe sleep applications and audio osmosis won't work, but there's a lot of interesting brainwave monitoring devices. Three alone launched last year through crowdfunding. Um, and one of the ones that I'm most excited about, and I think the leader in the field, is a company called Emotive. Uh, and their CEO, Tan Lee, and uh, Vice President Kim Du are in the audience. We're, we're working with Emotive and using their headsets to monitor brainwave activity as students uh, learn. So if a student's using the Osmosis mobile app, the goal is to eventually get a measure of their engagement. We can track their alpha and beta waves. Um, and at, at one point, we are, were even considering doing an experiment. If any of you are teachers and want to, want to talk more about this, I'd be happy to. Where if you've seen the presidential debates, they have real-time approval ratings. So at TED Med this past April, we did an initial pilot where we put uh, headsets on 20 audience members while they were listening to TED Talks. And we wanted to see you know, which TED Talks were the most engaging. Typically, they're all engaging, but some of them are better than others. Um, and then we, uh, so the results were inconclusive at that point, but you can imagine that collective brainwave monitoring may be a way to get feedback for the professor, but also, more importantly, for that individual student, we can let that student, uh, we can dynamically change the content. So if they're losing focus while watching, say, a swivel-produced MOOC uh, lecture, they can then, uh, it'll pause the lecture and say, hey, look, refocus and come back later. So that's the 20,000-foot uh, the, uh, view of that. And uh, this is second to last slide. Um, basically, there's a lot of other wearable electronics, or what I call wearatronics, that weren't developed, again, for education, but I think will have applications to it. So augmented reality systems like Google Glass, or on top left, you could see from the student's perspective, maybe they can see what their to-do list is, or they're reading Pride and Prejudice, and they don't understand, they don't know the definition of one of the words that they encounter. Instead of uh, not ever looking it up, which 95% of students probably would do, um, they could use Google Glass, maybe the optical character recognition on Glass, to look it up right then and there, like Google Now does. And so I'm excited by, you know, again, think about Fogg's behavior model, increase the ability for students to learn on the go and passively through osmosis. On the bottom left, uh, we have an eye tracking software, uh, eye tracking glass that could also be used to measure engagement. Right now it's used for marketing purposes, but I think education uh, is also a major application. And on the bottom right, this is a bracelet that gets your electrocardiogram, your heart rhythm activity, and uh, identifies who you are, so it's biometrics. And this is obviously of interest potentially for MOOCs, which need to give credit and certify people who are taking the test at the other side of the screen or halfway across the world are who they say they are. So to summarize, Unfortunately, osmosis, uh, learning by osmosis doesn't work like this right now, where knowledge diffuses from an area of high concentration to low concentration. But through, through uh, mobile innovation and uh, educational gadgets, the mission of our company is to get it to that point. And so with that, I'd like to thank you for your kind attention and take any questions now or later. That's great. Thank you. <clears throat> So next on our roster is Tara Dowdell from Corning. So we're going to talk about Gorilla Gl Glass. So Tara, welcome. We're glad that you're here. Thank you. And following uh, Tara's uh, presentation, we're going to give our uh, much anticipated trivia question. So we're very excited about that. So turn it over to you. Thank you. OK, thank you. Good afternoon. You're still awake post-lunch haze? Or should I say good morning, right? It's Las Vegas, so this is the morning session, right? Just had <laughs> breakfast. OK, so I'm very proud and pleased to be here to, uh, this afternoon. I work for Corning Incorporated, so some of you are wondering, why is Corning here? Why is she speaking? Uh, it's a materials uh, science company. And you're absolutely right. So that's the good news. I'm not here to sell you anything, because you're, you are not the people that, that buy what Corning does. Uh, as I mentioned, we are a material science company. And so the way I like to look at it is that we make the products that you do buy, we improve them through our materials. OK. Uh, click. See, I'm not smart enough to operate the technology. There we go. OK. So in 2011, uh, Corning put a video out there on YouTube, and this went viral. It's considered to be one of the uh, most popular corporate videos released. And um, basically, you know, the, why did it resonate with people? And it was a couple different reasons why. One was this environment in which devices and displays seamlessly um, worked, communicated, whether it was a small device, a large display. They, you know, people were able to sort through a lot of data, complex information, intuitively, quickly, and it was everywhere that they went, 
right? Home, school, work, they liked that. They also liked the cleanness of the environment and they liked the collaboration. And so this really resonated with them uh, and they really liked that. And so as we think about education, what does this mean? You know, so Day Made a Glass was really Corning's vision for the future. Where do we see you know, technology in the future? And so as we think about education and what I'm showing here is basically a speech that President Obama did in June of last year. And what I wanted to sort of highlight was a, a couple different points as relates to education, which is you know, around bringing students into the digital age and how technology can help in the classroom. And actually, I think our first uh, presenter, uh, our professor, was actually talking a lot about this. So um, some of the content for, on this slide is actually from a great, uh, I, I thought it was a really good documentary produced by American Works, and the link is at the bottom of the slide. Uh, if you're not familiar with it and you're interested in checking it out. And again, our first presenter actually uh, touched on this quite a lot. So if you look at evolutions uh, in learning, so you know how it first started out, your one room schoolhouse, lots of children, different ages, a teacher, she's uh, you know, going from student to student. Uh, the way you could look at this is saying, okay, individualized education, but the problem with it is that it's a very small environment. So it's not really um, feasible for mass education, teaching lots of students. So from there, we go to the schoolroom environment where you have lots of student, lots of students, but then the problem that you then have is you have lots of students, different abilities. So you've got students that are advanced, that they're ahead of the class, and so for many of the lectures, they're sort of bored. And then you have some of the other students who actually need a little bit of help, and they're, you know, say, behind, and the teacher is basically trying to manage all these different abilities. So where are we today? And I think you saw that um, with our, what we call the interactive whiteboard there. Classrooms today are beginning to put these kinds of technologies in the classroom. And again, as our first presenter was talking about, you've got this kind of weird transition right now where teachers are like, wow, well, I've got content in my textbook, but I got this interactive thing here and there's some fun games there and I don't really know how to deal with both of it, and it's kind of a little bit awkward, should we say, because you know, in some ways, actually, the teacher hasn't been properly trained, you know, and they're, they're, they, because they don't have the time, and so they don't really know how to use it and how to integrate it into what, the, what, it's, what they're trying to do. And so what Corning wants to do is basically take that a step further, and this was part of the vision in the day made a glass, which is you know, taking that technology, that interactive technology, putting it in a classroom where you have small displays, large displays, you know, again, building on this vision that President Obama talked about, you know, having the internet, having the children have access to the internet, having digital technology, and enabling you to deliver you know, that mass education, but it's tailored to the children's abilities. So those that are ahead, are, or, or should, you know, that have basically completed content for that particular lecture, they could go on to do other things. Those that require a little bit of extra time, they can do, you know, they can continue working through the problems. And the teacher actually becomes more of a roaming conductor, you know, so not as we saw in the beginning where the teacher stood at the, class, the front of the class going, and please look at this, and please look at that, you know, and then the student comes up to the board and they write on the board. Actually, all the students are there, they've got their tablets, their slates, and the teacher's using the front, and what you see there is a scene from a day made of glass where the teacher, you know, she elaborates on the content, but then she's able to go around and work with the students, and they can work through the problems at their own pace, again, you know, getting through um, the material. So, you know, it's engaging delivery, they're excited, they're interested, it's fun, it's mass education, individualized learning, you have access to lectures and content, you know, famous professors, you know, they can't go to every school, but you can tap into that because you can get onto the internet and you can, you know, you can hear what they have to say. And the content is current, so it's not like a textbook that's there uh, from like, you know, the 1950s or something like that. Okay, so how is Corning helping to drive this? Well, so for, we are a very old company and we've been around for about 162 years. And we have you know, worked through different uh, enabling glass technologies, uh, bringing this into the information age. And so here we are, Corning Gorilla Glass. And so with Corning Gorilla Glass, um, this is currently deployed on about uh, a billion devices. So smartphones, slates, tablets in the, in the marketplace today. 
have Corning Gorilla Glass on the front of them, which is basically enabling them, uh, it protects the device. And so, you know, again, how does this relate to education? Again, as you think about, you know, interactive displays, currently the cover glass that they have on the front of it is very thick, it's very heavy, and the problem that you end up with is that your finger is then quite away from the sensor. And so as you're trying to get it to operate, you basically find that you end up with a very imprecise display because then you're like tap, 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 and, and it's not actually functioning properly. And if the teacher is at the front of the class and so she's you know, stood to an angle and she's trying to get it to work, we end up with something called a, a parallax, which is basically an optical distortion because where the teacher thinks the sensor is, it isn't actually there because you've got this big fat cover glass on the front of it. And so basically, you know, that teacher is pressing in the wrong place. So, you know, Corning Gorilla Glass, um, you know, our secret source, if you like, or our special composition, enables you to, um, to move to a much thinner piece of glass without compromising the damage resistance of the glass. And it's also highly scratch resistant. And so if you think about, you know, product lifetime, because let's face it, schools never have money, right? Never have money. Budget is important. You want a product that you know that when you make that investment, because these aren't cheap, right? When you make that investment, you want to know that it's going to last you. And it's going to last you for a while. And it's not going to get damaged, uh, you know, easily or quickly. And so that's where Corning Gorilla Glass comes into, um, comes into effect or comes into play. Um, and, and so at CES, you know, we're, so Corning Gorilla Glass came out, I think, in 2011. Uh, to, uh, this year at CES, we're looking at Corning, uh, uh, antimicrobial Corning Gorilla Glass. And this is basically where we've taken the glass, we've now infused silver into the glass, which acts as an antimicrobial agent. Um, you know, I don't know how much I need to say about that other than children, snotty noses. I think you got it, right? So, um, and then we're also looking at other technologies such as, you know, easy to clean, uh, things like that. So, um, again, taking materials, making them, um, looking at the needs of people uh, and products, and looking at how the materials that we innovate and develop can make those products better. And so, you know, obviously this is supposed to be a technology demonstration, so um, our booth at CES does have uh, a touch display. I was not going to wheel that thing over here. So um, if you'd like to come and take a look at the multi-touch displays that we're featuring in our booth, please do come along to Central Hall and take a look at them. And so that's, uh, you know, perhaps, let's say, one high-tech area. Uh, what I'm here to demonstrate, because again, demonstration session, is a passive whiteboard, also known as a marker board, which has evolved from a chalkboard. And so this is a piece of Corning Gorilla Glass. This is actually, uh, I think, a 47-inch diagonal. It's made of glass. It's not plastic or, or anything like that. It's actually made of glass. This is Corning's Gorilla Glass, which is highly damage resistant, scratch resistant. And this is a terrific example, I think, of how highly engineered glass is actually delivering and bringing value to everyday products. So if you think about you know, glass marker boards, in order to have that damage resistance that, um, you know, to be able to withstand, let's say, high traffic environments, it has to be very thick. Very thick. Oh, sorry. Uh, very thick, very heavy, um, and so, you know, as you can see, I don't need to go to the gym to, in order to uh, hold this up. So thin, lightweight, scratch resistance. Um, you can move it around in the classroom. Now again, Corning makes the glass. We don't actually make the marker boards. And at CES, um, we did a press release, a company called Morco. They're actually the third company. Uh, to announce a line of products, a uh, line of marker board, glass marker board products, which feature Corning Gorilla Glass. And you probably know some of their brands, Bolt and Best Right. Um, and so now they have a line of glass marker boards which feature Corning Gorilla Glass on them. Um, these are also stain resistant, so I'm showing you some, I'm gonna, because again, demonstration, I'll demonstrate how to use the marker board with a marker pen. Um, you can actually write on it with a Sharpie and you can still erase it. So, um, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Okay, 
So, demonstration. All right, are you ready? Okay. Pen, top remove. There you go, excellent. Here's my, my uh, beautiful assistant. Okay. Take pen, write. So that's our uh, booze at CES. Hope you'll drop by and come and see us. And so one final comment that I wanted to make was, um, so we are a glass uh, and ceramics material science company. Uh, you know, that's what we work on, but basically we need to partner with other companies, software companies, hardware companies, in order to make, you know, the vision that we put forward in a day made of glass uh, forward. And we're very excited about, about doing that. So thank you for your time today. And so you think I'm finished, but no, it's just like, oh my gosh, she just keeps going, she keeps going. So I think what we're going to do now is show a 30-second clip uh, from A Day Made of Glass. And so you might think that that's your chance to escape, but it's actually not, because I think we're going to give away some stuff too. Okay. Thank you, Tom. So are you going to do the trivia yes, questions Yes, we have a couple now? of trivia okay. questions that we're going to pull up. And we have some A4 size marker boards, as we mentioned earlier today, that Corning has uh, donated to the cause. So let's get our trivia questions pulled up there. And we'll have a couple lucky winners. Someone won earlier today. Are you still here who won our first trivia question? Uh, well, I'll just take that back with me, and I will hold that for you. <laughs> okay, let's go. So, uh, in 2012-2013, how much did teachers spend on classroom equipment and supplies using their own out-of-pocket money? Is it A, B, C, or D? Someone raise their hand. You got to let me know, B. sir. D? B. B. B? B? No, you're right. It is D. Overall, the expenditures by teachers was $3.2 billion, but their out-of-pocket money was $1.6 billion, so that is correct. Very good, sir. Very good. All right, next question. In the NCES IES report, projection on education statistics to 2021, enrollment in pre-K through eighth grade between 1996 and 2021 is projected to grow the fastest at a rate of what percent? Someone raise their hand. Right there, yes. In the white. Beige. No, it's not A. Yes, right here. You are correct. It is C. Very nice. I'm going to get in the middle of the room so I can see the winners, the hands better. 
Yes, that's the fastest growing segment as well is the pre-K through eighth grade. Very interesting. And our last prize, our last trivia question. Okay, according to the Chronicle 2010 enrollment data, the largest for-profit online college has student enrollment of? Yes, right here. No, not A. Right there in the blue shirt. No, B. Right here, B. Yes. Does anyone know what school that is? University of Phoenix, you are correct. All right, that's our trivia for today. Thank you, Corning. Thank you for those prizes. And thank you to all our panelists.